I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 110, and then also um, the book of Hebrews will be bouncing around a little bit back and forth. On December 26th, I was in Psalm 40, and um, again, I'm, I'm kind of finding a, a renewed interest in the Messianic Psalms, and uh, the Psalm 40 was about the Incarnation. Um, it's, it's quoted and applied to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, where it says, um, when he came into the world, God had prepared a body for him. And um, that body, as we know, is uh, the little Jesus Christ who was born and incarnated. We celebrate around Christmas. Um, this is another psalm that has to do with the Messiah. And this is uh, his current ministry. Some of us, you know, we really celebrate Christmas. And boy, we really talk about uh, prophecy and his coming back. Well, what's he up to right now? Is uh, Jesus kind of twiddling his thumbs, just waiting what's going on? Well, Psalm 110 tells us it's probably, it's one of the most quoted psalms in all of the New Testament, Psalm 110. And uh, we get it, uh, it's pretty cool because Peter and Paul both exegete Psalm 110, if you will, exegete. Exegesis is um, uh, what we try to do around here, and, and um, Bible-believing churches all around the world do that. This guy gets up here and he exegetes a passage. So it's basically, uh, you read the text, explain the text, and apply the text. And um, it really helps when you have someone like the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul interpret Psalm 110 for us. And they did that in the book of Acts and also in the book of Hebrews. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And um, I invite you to pray with me. I, I skipped way back here. Wow, I jumped ahead. Sorry about that. Um, if see, I could I could really use some prayer right now. <clears throat> Lord, um, thank you for your word. Thank you for David who wrote this originally and uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for Peter and Paul and other New Testament writers. John, in fact, um, addresses this very important topic of what is Jesus doing now, and how does that relate to us? And we pray. God, we thank you for uh, the exciting time we've already had here in your house with your people and in various uh, aspects of church life. And now, God, help us. Um, we would just kind of focus on your word and what it means to us. Please apply it to our hearts and lives. We ask your blessings upon those who are ministering uh, next door in the nursery and then also children's church, that you would bless these eager little children. Uh, with the truth of their Lord and Savior and Creator, Jesus. Amen. Well, okay, um, one of the things that people uh, who aren't Christians, um, they um, criticize the Bible for a lot of things. Um, one of them is that um, certain words that we hold dear are not found in the Bible, and they think that kind of throws our faith in a ditch. For example, Trinity. Um, they think they've really got one over on us when they say, you know, the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. Duh, the word Trinity is English. Okay, so of course it doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. But it doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible in, in Greek or Hebrew either. So they think, ah, oh, you know, you guys believe in three gods, which is really only one God, and you don't make any sense. And the fact is, it's very mysterious, the whole idea of the Trinity. Um, but from page 1 in Genesis chapter 1, we get an indication of the Trinity. When uh, God says, let us, let us make man in our image. So right away, uh, we believe in one God, but there's some conversations going on. And uh, so we take it as a, a measure of faith that, yes, uh, the Trinity, the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible, but we conclude, since the scriptures are inspired and inerrant, and they tell us there's one God, and those same inspired, inerrant scriptures tell us that that one God is in three persons, so we take that as a measure of faith. Why? Because it's all the way through the Bible, if you know what to look for. And this is one of those examples 
the first few verses of Psalm 110, there's a conversation going on between the Father and the Son. See, some people think, uh, like it's called modalism, but they believe, um, yes, Jesus is God, yes, the Holy Spirit's God, yes, the Father's God, but they don't appear at the same time. And so back to the Old Testament, it's the Holy Spirit, it's, it's the Father, and then the Gospels, uh, God manifests himself in Jesus, and now in our lifetime in the epistles, God manifests himself as the Holy Spirit. That's called modalism, and it's heresy. The fact is, we know com- there's incredible amount of evidence in the Bible that they had to exist at the same time because they're talking to each other. And this is one, Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, so um, uh, one of the things that we're at a disadvantage with in uh, English is that looks like it's the same word. The Lord says to my Lord, I'm using the New American Standard, yours may be a little bit different, but the first one, the Lord, is Yahweh. That's the very special name that God gave to Moses. And in fact, I just heard uh, someone in the audience as we were closing down that last song, their previous song, and we were praying, someone said Yahweh. And uh, that's, one of, that's God's special name. But in the same line, the next word, Lord, is Adonai. Adonai is um, the powerful one. So there's a, there's a personal name for God here, and there's a powerful name for God here. And notice what it says, the Lord says to my Lord. <clears throat> There's a conversation going on here. David is acknowledging God, the Lord, Yahweh, is talking to my Lord, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Sit at my right hand. So what does the, what does the Father say to the Son? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord, verse 4, has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So what is Jesus doing right now? What is his current ministry? I heard Chaz pray, Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He is our high priest. What is he doing right now? He is praying for you if you're his child. And guess what? His father always hears his prayer. In fact, there are no prayers that Jesus would utter that would go unanswered. So what does that mean to us? You have an all-powerful God right now advocating for you, praying for you that your faith would not fail, that you would be strong in the, in the presence of temptations and trials and tribulations. And haven't there been a bunch of them the last few years? In fact, it's always been that way. Since the fall of man, there's trials and tribulations. But what do we have in Jesus Christ? We have the one who conquered death, who defeated the devil, the one who ascended to heaven. We have him on our side. He is interceding right now. He's praying. He's helping me to communicate to you. And he's helping you listen to his word. He is praying for you when those times when you feel lonely. I had a conversation with someone just this week. Uh, Again, uh, just like so many of you have uh, felt loss. Her husband passed away uh, one month ago yesterday. And uh, she hasn't been out of the house since. She hasn't been uh, out of her pajamas. She said, uh, Pastor Bill, I I get up and I take a shower and then I just put my bed clothes on and sit on the couch for a month. She said, I have no hope. I am lonely and I need someone. So I'm going to go over and share with her the hope she could have in Jesus Christ. She's gone to church all of her life. Never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I said, well, it must have been pretty hard to lose someone you love over Christmas. She said, well, Christmas never meant anything to us anyway. I thought, how sad. We celebrate the birth of your Savior. She said, well, I've never known him that way. I said, well, you will. So um, Jesus is interceding for her. 
Jesus is interceding for us to witness to her. And he is, I think, drawing her. He's wooing her. He's loving her that she would recognize her sin, her need for a Savior, and how to receive him and to uh, make that connection. So I hope that uh, I have an opportunity to do that. You know, uh, what is Jesus doing right now? Well, the very first martyr, there's been thousands and thousands since, but in Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen is being stoned to death for the incredible crime of telling the truth. <laughs> He's telling these people um, the history of Israel. And God has done this, 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 and this on your behalf, and you killed him. And so they're going to kill him too. But my point here is what is Stephen? Um, he's not only believing Jesus for his salvation, but he says as the life just ebbs out of him, he says, Jesus, receive my spirit. Isn't that what Jesus said on the cross? Father, receive my spirit. Stephen is incredibly aware that this Jesus who was murdered, buried, rose again, and ascended to the Father is hearing his pleas. He's able to do something. And in fact, the scripture goes on to say that Jesus stands up and the heavens are opened and Stephen sees him. And he stands up to receive the very first Christian martyr in history. Well, we can take a lot of stuff from that. But one of the things that I hope we can take is that God is painfully aware of our suffering, of our tests, our tribulations, our trials, our diseases, our difficulties, our brokenness. Jesus is aware what was going on on earth with Stephen. And he is aware of what's going on right now in your life. You say, well, you know, I, I got some bad news from the doctor, or I got some bad news from my employer, or I got some bad news from my spouse or my kids. or my. None of that catches Jesus unaware. So what's he been doing for 2,000 years? He's been interceding for the church, his, his bride, the body of Christ. So... <clears throat> Uh, just four things real quick uh, in your outline there. Uh, first of all, the Father's greeting. Uh, it's kind of interesting, <clears throat> Dan's uh, Sunday school class in the previous hour, <laughs> frequently I, I jot down some stuff in there that I said, wow, I could use that in my sermon. Because a lot of times uh, his class and my sermon kind of coincide. It's almost like God's in control or something. But... Uh, <clears throat> He gave the examples of uh, President Lincoln and uh, Ant Antonin Scalia, just um, very important people, prominent. And I was thinking in my mind I could add John F. Kennedy, where um, these powerful men, where people were intimidated by them, uh, their positions, um, President Lincoln's little boy, you know, uh, their family lost two of their children while he was president. And so this little boy was pretty precious to him. And while President Lincoln is trying to listen to these secretaries and all this political stress and strain, this little boy runs into the office and jumps into his lap. And he, his attention is diverted to this little boy. And he doesn't care what those guys are flapping their gums about. He's interested in his son. Same thing with uh, John F. Kennedy. You remember that famous picture where uh, John John is playing underneath the uh, the desk, and um, the Secret Service guy tried to prevent him. You can't go in there. That's the President of the United States. And Johnson said, no, he's not. He's my dad. Scalia, the same thing. This big, powerful man looked kind of stern behind this big, powerful desk. And his grandson runs into the, the presence of this judge, and his face just breaks out in a big smile, and he embraces these little kids. I think that's kind of what's going on here. I don't mean any disrespect. But I could kind of see the father giving the son a high five. I know some of you are saying, how spiritual does that sound? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Now, you remember the celebration of the prodigal son 
when he finally repented and came back to the father and there's a, you know, kill the fatted calf, throw, you know, I have this big party. Well, this isn't anything like that, but uh, because Jesus isn't a prodigal son. But he was sent on a mission. He was given a body. We celebrate that at Christmas. For the very purpose of sacrificing that body, Hebrews chapter 10, 5 and 6. That's why he came. And uh, the father gave him a mission. The son said, I'm happy to do my father's will. Even in the garden of Gethsemane, he's sweating great drops of blood. His body is saying, I don't want to go through this. But his spirit is saying yes to the father. Whatever your will, I will do. Just imagine what he went through to buy my salvation and your salvation. Spit upon a crown of thorns, spikes through his body parts, uh, ridicule and scorn and humiliation. He went through that for us. But he ultimately went through that for his father. He paid that propitiation I talked about when we were baptized and cool. He paid the price. And now I could just see the father saying, come on in here. And a high five, good job. Isn't that what he said at his baptism? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The father talking to the son, welcome back. Wow, for 30 plus years, you were down there in a body and we talked a lot. But you, I, I'm so glad to give you your glory back. That's what happened in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus temporarily emptied himself of his glory. And took on humanity. Well, he's got that glory back now. And I could just see the father saying, welcome home. Good job. Sit here. How long? Until. Psalm 110 verse 1. Sit at my right hand. Peter gives the interpretation there in Acts chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. This is 10 days after the ascension, right? The ascension is 40 days after the resurrection. Pentecost, 50 days. So 10 days after the ascension, when Jesus had told them, you guys go and wait and I'll send uh, the Holy Spirit back. Uh, Peter is now preaching. And he interprets Psalm 110, verse 1 for us. For it was not David who ascended into heaven. See, David wrote Psalm 110, and a lot of Jews might have been uh, confused about this. David is their king, man, and, and, uh, but it wasn't David that ascended to heaven. It was Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Paul gives an interpretation also in Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Paul gives a precise uh, exegesis, but to which of the angels has he ever said? So it's not David, it's not Moses, it's not the angels. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And then down in chapter 10, but he having offered one sacrifice for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made. So what's he doing right now? He's praying for us, he's interceding, but he's also waiting. He's biding his time until the father says, go fetch your bride. Well, that's the rapture, right? He's going to fetch us, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and take us. But that's still not the until. Until his enemies may be made a footstool for his feet. So Paul is interpreting this Psalm 110, until I make your enemies, that's still future And it's when Jesus Christ comes back again. So in the interim between the ascension and the second coming, he is interceding for us and he is waiting patiently to assume his kingdom. You see, he's, I know sometimes we sing about Jesus is the king of kings. Not yet. Right? It's okay to sing that. It's okay to believe and call him the king of kings but he is not yet on his throne. Notice here it says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. God is on the throne. Jesus is sitting next to him until he says, go and destroy your enemies, and then you'll have the throne that I promised to David. And it's going to be Christ's throne. So I don't mean any disrespect, but I think there's a party going on 
when Jesus arrived in heaven after the ascension. Second thing, um, the instructions. Sit here until you have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting, now this is Paul's interpretation, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject. But now, we don't see everything subjected to Jesus, right? That's why I say he's not the king now. There's still a lot of bad stuff going on. And even though he defeated the devil on the cross, and he uh, gives us power over the devil, Christ still has enemies. You might have noticed, right? Things aren't right right now. In fact, even in the hearts and minds of Christians, we are not totally 100% obedient to Jesus Christ. But someday we will. So here's Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> we do not see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Why does he have to wait? What's the delay? Well, he's interceding for us. He has to fulfill the role of high priest. He's waiting until, because God the Father is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance, God is building the church. Right? And aren't you glad the Father didn't send Jesus back before you got saved? <clears throat> I used to think when I got saved in the summer of 72, I thought, man, Christ is coming back any minute. I'm so glad he didn't. We all have loved ones that if Jesus would have come back already, they would have spent eternity without Christ. I'm glad he's patient. And it's not that he doesn't care about us. He said to his disciples, it's a good thing I'm leaving because I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit. Why would that be good? Because while he was on earth, Jesus was restricted to a body. He got tired. He got hungry. He was only in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit can help you. He's available 24-7. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, available 24-7. That's a good thing. So the Father's instructions. You sit here. <clears throat> until I make your enemies a footstool. Our Wednesday night Bible study, um, Luke chapter 19, you don't have to turn there right now if you don't want to, but uh, verses 11 to 27. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. What? Yeah, the triumphal, so-called triumphal entry, where he came in, they were shouting Hosanna, they were laying down palm branches, laying down their coats. They're so excited. Why? They thought for sure, this is the Messiah, and this is his kingdom going to start today. So what does he do? He tells them a parable. So he said to them, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself, and then returned. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Jesus Christ made a bona fide offer to Israel. I've got the credentials. I'm a descendant of David. I'm here. I'm the Messiah. They rejected it and didn't catch God off guard. He knew this was going to happen. So the kingdom is delayed, and it is still delayed today. He's coming back. He's going to rule from Jerusalem, but it ain't yet. So the father's instructions, sit here, son, <laughs> until <clears throat> I make your enemies a footstool. So the first delay was the rejection of the earthly rule of Christ, mentioned here in Luke chapter 19. The second delay from the ascension until the second coming is what we're experiencing right now. Why would he do that? 
so that he could be our high priest. The promise here in chapter 110, verse 2, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. I know about half of the church, Christianity, not this church, I hope. But roughly, there's a big division. I know that some people believe there's a spiritual kingdom and there's not a future kingdom on earth and Jerusalem. And, you know, we're the Jews, the spiritual Jews. We're Christians. With all due respect, that's hogwash. I am not a Jew. I never will be a Jew. I was born a Gentile. I was born again a Gentile. And I will live forever as a Gentile. But the promises to the Jews are real. They've been postponed. They haven't been canceled. Jesus Christ is coming back to keep his promises to Israel. And think about this, Christian. If he does not keep his promises to Israel, what makes you think he's going to keep his promises to the church? If God cannot be counted on to bring about his will with Jesus ruling from Mount Zion, he can't be counted on to rapture us out of the tribulation. The Father's promise, I will yet stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. Jesus hasn't ruled from Zion. He came into town and they killed him. So what's he doing? He's interceding. What made him qualified? Well, look at that picture, the crown of thorns and the spikes that were nailed into his hands and feet. That qualifies him uniquely to be our high priest. He has suffered to the shedding of blood. He has resisted. He's been ridiculed. He's been tested and tempted every way like you are, yet without sin. That's why he's qualified to intercede on our behalf. Paul again, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, much more. If God loved you enough while you were still his enemy to come and die for you, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. People say, well, you know, you don't really believe that once saved, always saved. Of course I do. If you're genuinely born again, because I hated God, I might not have verbalized it, but before the summer of 72, I was God's enemy, and he loved me enough to save me. Now that I'm his child, you think he's going to reject me? No. Check this out. Romans 8, one of the best chapters in the Bible he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If you're here today and you've received Christ as your Savior, you've got a blank check. Whatever you need to succeed in God's eyes, it's yours. Ephesians 1.3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He's already blessed us with those. Those are your possessions. Use it. Right? Hebrews 7.25. That picture there, as beautiful as it is, is nothing compared to what it must be like. Our Savior, risen, glorified. Remember that picture that in, John, in Revelation chapter 1 that John had? The flaming eyes, the white hair, the glowing robes, the, the, the feet like burnished bronze. His voice was like thunder. That's who's representing you right now before the Father. Wow. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is able also to save forever. Now, in the original language, that means save forever, okay? Those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. The, the 
all of Hebrews is pretty much an, uh, an expository sermon on the high priest and the sacrifice of Christ and the Old Testament sacrificial system. And, uh, you know, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, what was the problem with those Old Testament high priests? A, they couldn't really forgive sins. At the very best, all they could do was cover them once a year. But they had to keep coming back and offer a new sacrifice for the following year. So there was never any security. There's never any salvation. There's just a postponement of the inevitable. And oh, by the way, these high priests keep dropping dead. You got to get another one. Not Jesus. He always lives to make intercession for them. Well, who's he praying to? He's talking to his father. Father, I paid for his sins. And he received me in the summer of 72. I know he's still a jerk. <laughs> but he's my jerk. I bought him. And he's praying for me. Here's what John had to say about it. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation. There's that word again. The satisfactory payment for our sins. And not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. That's another thing. Half of Christianity gets wrong. They say, well, Jesus just died for certain people. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Well, does that mean universalism? Everybody's going to be saved? No. Just those who receive that payment by faith have it applied to their accounts. Well, last thing here as we're wrapping up, the Father's invitation. Here's another... Um, at the start of this book, Psalm number two, another conversation between the Father and the Son. The first three verses talk about the rejection and death of the Messiah. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. I think this might have future application as well from our vantage point, but it, it's probably also talking about the Messiah, the nations, the rulers, the kings took counsel to kill him. And they thought that'll be done with it. We don't want him to control us. What's going on in our world today? We don't want God's morality to control us. So let's just kill him. Well, what's he, uh, the second thing here in this conversation is, uh, <clears throat> let us tear their fetters apart, they're saying, the nations. And then how does God respond? Well, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord, that's the Adonai again, the sovereign, powerful God, scoffs at them. And then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then here's that conversation uh, <laughs> between the father, the son, and application to the nations. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's that Hebrews uh, interpretation again. When did he say that? When he came into the world. Incarnation. And then he says, ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. What's he talking about? They're going to be your footstools. Not yet. The nations are running rampant. They're, they're going crazy. The times of the Gentiles are, gonna, are, are destroying this world in the name of making it better. In the name of making it in their image instead of God's image. 
But someday the father's going to tell the son, okay, go. <laughs> I remember a long time ago I was preaching something and um, uh, I was wondering when Jesus Christ comes back with a shout, what's he going to say? And I think he might say, enough. And he will establish his kingdom in righteousness and destroy his enemies. Don't be scared. If you're united with him right now by faith, you've got a glorious future ahead of you. You're going to help rule on his kingdom on earth with Jesus Christ. Man. So let's make some applications here real quick. Jesus Christ is alive today interceding for us. Why? So that our faith will not fail and our accuser not prevail. Jesus is very active right now, praying to his Father on our behalf. But guess who else is active? Our enemy is the accuser of the brethren. He's a liar from the very beginning. He's a murderer. He's a thief. And what he does is he goes to the Father and says, did you see what Bill just did? He calls himself a Christian, and you call him your son? Look what he did. And the father, I could just see looking at the son, and Jesus said, yeah, I paid for that one too. You see, when Jesus paid for my sins, it wasn't just the ones that I committed up to the summer of 72. Jesus paid for every sin I will ever commit. That's why I cannot lose my salvation. All those sins were paid for, and Jesus always lives to make intercession for Bill. Little troublemaker, self-centered, self-righteous, greedy Bill. Amazing grace. Second thing, Jesus Christ is alive today interceding for us, guaranteeing that our salvation, if it's genuine, is eternal. He always lives to make intercession. If he interceded for me while I was an enemy, even so much more will he do now that I'm his son. I don't know what you guys do in your private moments of despair or wondering or questioning your faith. But if you're a Christian, I know what Jesus does in those moments. He's praying for you. He's praying that your faith will not fail. He's praying that you'll stand tall and that you'll rely on his power. Which brings us to the third and final point here. Uh... Technology. What would I do without it? <laughs> there it is. Jesus Christ is alive today interceding for us so that sin will not rule over us and we will experience victory. You know, a lot of children of God wrestle with certain things in our lives. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. I just can't get victory over X. That's because you're trying to get victory over X in your strength. You can't do it. It's too powerful. But if you rely on Jesus Christ, can you imagine that he can't get victory over X in your life? Can you imagine the indwelling Holy Spirit that is greater than he that is in the world? He's greater than the devil. He's more powerful. The devil can't resist him. And we are told in Scripture, resist the devil and he will flee us. It's not that he's afraid of me. He's afraid of the Holy Spirit in me. And please don't tell each other, you can't have victory over X. Jesus Christ has regenerated you. The Holy Spirit indwells you. The Father has uh, said you are righteous. He has declared you not guilty. You have been justified. 
Man, don't live in the muck. Your feet have been placed on a solid rock. That rock is immovable. We sang about that a little while ago, unshakable. Your relationship with God is not based on your frail attempts. Your relationship to God is eternal because of what God is doing. He declared you not guilty. His son is interceding for us 24-7. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to have victory. So let's close with a song and sing about Christ being our friend and our victory. And then I'll come up and pray.